Hello everyone, I'm Thersites the Historian, and I thought that I would provide some observations and analysis about a book I just finished reading, David Runciman's The Confidence Trap. Runciman is both a British nobleman and a political scientist. Apparently, when his father dies, he will become a Viscount, so bully for him, I suppose. Ironically, Runciman is a democratic theorist. How being a Viscount and a theorist of democracy is compatible, I don't quite know, although I suppose it would explain his obsession with Alexis de Tocqueville, who himself was also a nobleman obsessed with democracy. And speaking of that obsession with Tocqueville, Runciman provides about a 30-page introduction before getting into the crises that he discusses, just laying out the thought of Tocqueville, and he more or less accepts all of Tocqueville's claims about the nature of democracy. Effectively, his claim is that Tocqueville is fundamentally correct about democracy in terms of the strengths and weaknesses. The weaknesses of democracy are its inability to plan ahead, inability to prioritize due to all the background noise that's necessary to run a democracy, i.e. rumors run rampant, and people tend to promote whatever they're interested in without thinking about whether it is the most important thing or not. Democracies have an inability to learn from other democracies and can only learn from their own mistakes. But the strengths are that democracies don't quit because they don't know when they're defeated. And in this way, they are more resilient than autocracies, even if they are less efficient. Democracies also have a great deal of flexibility, adaptability, and confidence can be restored by a simple change in leadership. An election can give you a new leader, and with that new leader, you can be renewed and keep forging forward. In many ways, one of the things that he claims is simply that democracy is very good at muddling forward even when it doesn't know what to do, and then democracy just experiments until it figures things out. And that seems to be the strength of democracy, but the only reason that I know what he thinks the strength of democracy is is because I've been reading his follow-up book, How Democracy Ends, and between these two books I've been able to piece it together. Runciman never actually lays out the strengths of democracy in a way that is succinct and straightforward. So you kind of have to read a large chunk of his text and then sort of work backwards from that. One of the more interesting aspects of Runciman's book is that he chooses to look at a relatively compact survey of time, democracy from 1918 to the present, so only 100 years, or when this was published in 2013, only 95 years, but he does not discriminate geographically. And that latter decision, I think, sort of takes away from the focus of this work. So in 1918, the crisis of democracy was that World War I looked like it was one that the Allies might lose, and then German strength failed rather suddenly, and the Allies were suddenly victorious. After winning, they assumed that they had been superior all along, and that they had prevailed because they were better. This is an example of the confidence trap in his opinion, the idea that democracy, whenever it's victorious, forgets about the struggle that it had getting to that place of victory and looks back on their success as having been inevitable from the outset. In 1933, of course, you have the rise of Hitler in Germany, and you also have FDR in America. He shows how these two incidents were both extremely important and how democracy can respond very differently depending on circumstances. The first two chapters, I think, are very, very solid. When he gets further on, 1947, 1962, 1974, 1989, 2008, the international approach sort of loses its edge because he's comparing democracies which aren't very easily comparable. American democracy is well established and is deeply embedded at this point in American culture, whereas the democracy of India in the 60s was much less so. It was a new system of government and the population was not nearly so assimilated into a common culture the way that America is. Um, so the dynamics of the system are vastly different. And he points this out at various times that India today or Egypt 
when it still had some form of democracy, are much more similar to America in its early years than they are to America today. He also throws Britain, France, Germany, and other Western countries into the mix, but ultimately trying to create a unifying theory of democracy is very difficult given how different a lot of these democracies are. And Runciman, one of the weaknesses of the work is that he doesn't really go into some of the institutional differences between democracies. For instance, the U.S. system with a presidency functions very differently election to election than a European parliamentary system. The U.S. also has a less uh, automated system in terms of when the government shuts down, a lot of parks close, for instance, whereas in a place like Belgium, they had an extended shutdown and checks continued to be mailed out by the government and the bureaucracy continued to move forward with the last budget that was passed and it just kind of kept renewing until the government got back together and started passing new legislation. And those kind of differences, I think, are actually very important when you're trying to explain um, how democracy works. Another thing that I was a little put off by is that his focus in this work was heavily on foreign policy. Whereas he thinks that the strength of a democracy and its success or failure is largely due to its internal strength or lack of internal cohesion. And I feel like that's a bit of a contradiction. If a democracy's strength and therefore success or failure depends on internal factors, why focus on a democracy's foreign policy? Um, he also says things to the effect that democracy can't bluff because public debate leaks out, so democracy's opponents know exactly what's going to happen. I think that's a fair point. But then, based on the way he lays it out, it's not exactly clear how democracies manage to muddle through wars. Um, so, one issue I had is that while I don't necessarily object to using Tocqueville's categories of analysis, and I think Runciman does a good job of showing that what Tocqueville said at that early juncture proved to be remarkably prescient, even if it's not completely perfect. Um, I feel like in many ways Runciman was maybe trying too hard to fit what he was seeing into the lens of Tocqueville. That he was trying to make the evidence conform to his preconceived notions in some way. Um, another thing that I found a little obnoxious, and this is more of a personal thing for me because, I, as I've mentioned before, I have very little patience for moralizing, is because Runciman was eager to engage with prior scholarship, he spends a lot of time quoting prior political scientists, including people like Hayek and others, who engage in a good deal of moralizing about democracy and although he himself doesn't moralize or do any of those things deliberately because he quotes so many people who moralize endlessly, he then goes into moralization himself, and that's not really in keeping with the current practices of the political science as I understand it. Then again, I mean, perhaps there are some subfields of political science that I'm not completely familiar with, so maybe that actually is still a current practice in today's political science, although I'm rather skeptical of that. Even in the British version of academia, where you still have gentlemen scholars like uh, Mr. Runciman, the future Viscount. One thing that I feel that Runciman is a bit blind to, and it makes sense given his high social standing and wealth, is that he doesn't seem to sufficiently credit the role that powerful interest groups play in really shaping the democratic process and how that can create alienation and also how that is fundamentally not democratic. Um, he doesn't really go into that much. When he does, it's in passing. He'll acknowledge that it is a thing and then just kind of move on. And in both this book and the follow-up book, he is at great pains to try to explain why populism is bad and why it is inherently a philosophy for losers. Partly it's because in his epilogue where he goes into populism, Donald Trump had just been elected, and as you might imagine, someone who has a PhD in something like political science looks at someone like Donald Trump as profoundly unaccomplished and unintelligent. 
Um, to his credit, however, Runciman does not try to pretend that Trump is a fascist. Rather, he says that Trump is sort of a populist uh, and that he sort of tries to fit Trump and American populism into European populism. And European populism has pretty much always been, or at least in the recent past, been very much a sort of right-wing thing. So his example of who Trump is drawing upon in American history is William Jennings Bryan. And that was puzzling to me until I figured out that Runciman's understanding of American history is somewhat cursory. Because William Jennings Bryan was not anything like Trump whatsoever. The two could hardly be more different. Not only that, but he also tries to say that William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold speech was inherently anti-Semitic because he was using Christian rhetoric and talking about bankers. And he also, in his follow-up book, talks more about that and says that Brian was trying to stir up resentment against the elites who somehow must have stolen something from the people. But now that I know Runciman's social background, all of this makes sense. As someone who feels like he's a one of the good nobles, he thinks that the elites are inherently good and well-intentioned, and that's just sort of a misunderstanding. But he does also, at the same time, recognize that inequality is a real problem in a democracy and that this breeds discontent and that discontent may contain within it the seeds of a democracy's destruction. But I don't want to get too far into his book that I'm reading right now. By the way, How Democracy Ends is a far better book than The Confidence Trap. Um, the Confidence Trap is fairly mediocre, whereas How Democracy Ends is actually a very, very solid book. Um, overall, I think that Runciman's idea of a confidence trap actually does have quite a bit of merit, and I think that he made it most clearly when he was discussing 1989 and the issue of the so-called end of history. That, of course, is a quote from Francis Fukuyama. One thing I really appreciated about David Runciman's take on Fukuyama is that he points out the changes in Fukuyama's thought from 1989 when he published an article called The End of History and then 1996, when he had the book version that's more well-known now, uh, The End of History and the Last Man. And he shows how Fukuyama's original article actually had some more restraint than the book. Fukuyama worried, for instance, that democracy would overreach in the absence of an enemy. In the book, he seems to take a more democratic, triumphalist approach largely because the article was hailed as one of the most brilliant pieces of political science in recent memory. And then with the book, he wrote a follow-up and it sold millions of copies and he became fabulously wealthy and was pretty much the leading intellectual of the 90s. Um, but I feel like uh, Runciman actually does a good job of showing where Fukuyama went right and wrong and shows that while his argument does contain some democratic triumphalism, it also has some restraint and intelligence to it at the same time. So Runciman does a good service there, since Fukuyama is often cited by people who don't quite understand what he's trying to say. Um, but anyway, the confidence trap of 1989 is the idea that Democracies, especially the United States, thought that their triumph over the Soviet Union was due to brilliant decision-making and the inherent superiority and virtues of the democratic system. And as Runciman points out, while there might be some truth to the idea that Western democracy has an inherent set of advantages over Soviet communism, this doesn't mean that it's without flaw. It also doesn't mean that it can proceed apace without ever running into difficulties again. So he thinks that democracy has fallen into a trap, it's become lazy in many ways, and that while democracy in the past has managed to muddle through crises through experimentation, it is possible that we might face a crisis too great, and that the weaknesses of democracy, i.e. the inability to plan ahead, will prove to be greater than the strengths of democracy, i.e. experimentation and the ability to muddle through and recreate legitimacy through elections. So I feel like 
his overall argument is actually compelling, although the way that he got there was a little rough in places. Um, and also, like I said, I don't feel like this book was fully focused. But if you do want to read one of Runciman's works, I highly recommend How Democracy Works. Apparently, he also has a podcast. I have not listened to it, but it sounds like it would be pretty cool, and I do plan on checking it out at some point. So, anyway, those are my thoughts on The Confidence Trap by David Runciman. Until next time, I am Thersites the Historian, and I will see you around when I see you around.